So that's Revelations chapter 15, verse 5. After this, I looked, and in heaven the temple, that is the tabernacle of the testimony, was opened. <clears throat> Out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues. They were dressed in clean, shining linen and wore golden sashes round their chests. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go, pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land, and ugly and painful sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it turned into blood like that of a dead man, and every living thing in the sea died. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. Then I heard the angel in charge of the water say, You are just in these judgments, you who are and who were the Holy One because you have so judged. For they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was given the power to scorch people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat, and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify him. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. Men gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they refused to repent of what they had done. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euph Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false, false prophet. They are spirits of demons performing miraculous signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle on the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him, so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne, saying, It is done. Then came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since man has been on earth. So tremendous was the quake. The great city split into three parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Every island fled away, and the mountains could not be found. From the sky, huge hailstones of about a hundred pounds each fell upon men, and they cursed, on, cursed God on account of the plague of hail, because the plague was so terrible. This is the word of the Lord. Do please keep that passage of Revelation open and let's pray to God for his help as we come to his word. Revelation 1 verse 3 says, Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy 
and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. Father, we praise you again, as we've done many times over the last few weeks, for the words of this prophecy. And we ask again that you would help us to hear them and to take them to heart, and so to find your blessing. Amen. A picture like this one does not give us all the details. For those listening online, I'm showing a yellow warning sign. It's got, a, got words which read danger, electric shock risk. It's got an electricity bolt hitting a man in the heart and the man is falling over or dead possibly. Doesn't give us all the details. Uh, were I to touch the electricity pylon, how exactly would the electrical charge flow into my body? How long would it take to kill me? What kind of voltage would actually be needed to kill me? What would it feel like as I die? Lots of details I'm not actually given, but a very clear take-home message. Stay away from the pylon. Danger. Electric shock risk. And as we come to this next section of Revelation, chapter 15, 5 to the end of 16, there are lots of details we're not given and lots of questions that we may have that simply are not answered. Things where it's hard to say with certainty. So are the plagues, which are expressions of God's judgment, are they symbolic of a dreadful reality? Or will they be experienced literally? I lean towards the symbolic myself, but it's hard to say with certainty. When exactly will this judgment be experienced? Will it be at certain times between Jesus' first coming and his second coming? Or will it be all to do with the second coming, wrapped up in the events of the final judgment? I lean towards that, but it's hard to say with certainty. Do seven bowls of judgment mean seven sequential stages of judgment, so that one stage is followed by another? Or does the number seven, as it does elsewhere in Revelation, signify completion, the whole package? So that what we're being given is not seven sequences, but the whole portrait of God's wrath. I lean that way, but it's hard to say with certainty. Lots of details we're not given, some questions that are not answered. And yet, let me suggest that this passage teaches us clear and vital things about God. What he is like. What his judgment will be like. Lessons which are for our good and our blessing if God would give us the humility to hear them. Now, we're not going to work through the passage in order. We're just going to dwell together on two big truths about God's judgment. To start, let's face up to what will have struck most people, I imagine, most forcibly as the passage was read. It's the reason the passage is so uncomfortable. God's wrath... His anger will be terrible to experience. Um, Just look briefly at chapter 15, verse 1, which um, kind of introduces the plagues, really. I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues, last because with them God's wrath is completed. And then 16.1, halfway through, go pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. We're in the realm this morning of God's wrath, his judicial anger, the anger of a creator expressed against rebellious creatures. And if that all feels thoroughly unpleasant and surprising to you that a God would be angry at all, do hold on to that thought because we'll come back to it. This passage is about the outpouring of God's anger and it makes it clear how terrible it will be to be on the receiving end. Bowl number one, verse two. Just look at that one. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land, and ugly and painful sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. Um, That is, people who refuse God in Revelation language. And the picture is a grim one, isn't it? Imagine walking around Westbourne, 
And as you see the exposed parts of people's flesh, you see raw and oozing sores, uh, groans and grimaces on people's faces. People bristle with pain as you brush past them or as their clothing rubs against the sores. People are trying to sit on a bench to rest, but they can't get comfy because of the sores. A queue forms outside Westbourne Medical Center. Once again, bandages and ointment have run out. They're waiting for the next shipment. Yes, it may well be symbolic, but what are the symbols meant to teach us? It will be terrible to experience God's wrath. I met a friend for lunch in Bournemouth Gardens this week. And sitting under the shade of a tree, looking out on the green grass as the stream flowed through the gardens, as people laughed and sunbathed and joked around on their lunch break, the reality of God's wrath seems distant and unlikely. And so I need this passage, because the happiness in Bournemouth Gardens will not last. Those people, many of them, those who are unforgiven, those who have the mark of the beast in Revelation language, will one day endure the terrible experience of God's anger. You may have noticed that the plagues are reminiscent of the Exodus plagues from the book of Exodus when people were, God's people were being taken out of the land of Egypt. And those plagues showed God's utter control, his sovereignty over creation, They showed his absolute power to judge his stubborn enemies. And here we are again, except Egypt has become the whole world. Not just the sea, sorry, not just um, the the sores, but the sea is affected. Verse 3, the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea. Um, Everything dead. Imagine the floating carcasses washed up on the beach. Not just the sea, but rivers and springs of water as well. Imagine the flow of blood through Bournemouth Gardens. The sun later on, which makes life possible now, is in this portrait, scorching people with fire. And by the end, a storm, an earthquake, a plague of giant hail. It's as if one by one, the aspects of this created world, which we currently enjoy so much and depend on, are turned into agents of destruction and distress. You can see that distress most clearly, I think, in verse 10. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. His kingdom was plunged into darkness. Men gnawed their tongues in agony. Sometimes people joke, don't they? I won't mind being in hell. All my mates will be there. It'll be fun. Here is a picture of people gnawing their tongues in agony. And this kind of distress language is not unique to Revelation. The Lord Jesus, while on earth warning about judgment himself, said there will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth. Really important for every follower of Jesus to see that Revelation is not an aberration, it's not a weird bit of the Bible. It's giving fuller expression to what the Lord Jesus himself has said. God's wrath will be terrible to experience. Now, sometimes churches like ours get criticized for being too heavy on God's wrath and too light on God's love. I think we probably are too light on God's love. By which I mean, I think we could and should marvel more at the astonishing love of God. The way he's blessed us with so many things in creation, the things we've enjoyed this weekend. The way that for his people, he's chosen us before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. The way that that has happened through the adoption, through Jesus Christ, who redeemed us by his blood shed on the cross. We're having a sermon series shortly in the evenings. I think it begins tonight or next week. And it's on big words in the Bible that end in shun, redemption, adoption, justification. And I hope it will be a chance to marvel at the love of God together. I think we could do more of that as a church, to be heavier on God's love. 
But I have to say, I think the criticism is wrong. We are too light on God's love, yes. And we are too light on God's wrath. And I say that because I know I am too light on God's wrath. In my thinking about people, in my praying for people, in my relationships with people, the reality of God's wrath, as portrayed here, simply does not affect me as it should does not concern me as it should, does not move me as it should. That's why this passage jars with me. That's why I need this passage. Because in my everyday life, I slip into thinking about God's wrath not very much, as if it's a not very bad reality. And so I need this passage to open my eyes again to the reality that it will be terrible to experience the anger of God. You might say, well, we shouldn't be frightening people with God's wrath, surely. Well, if by that you mean we shouldn't manipulate people or engage in coercive behavior, of course you're right. But is this imagery not frightening? If you were to walk between the lanes of a motorway and say, I will not be frightened by the cars either side of me, we'd say you're mad. You need to know what those cars can do to you. You should be frightened. And if we live in God's world with no concern at all for what it will be like to meet him in judgment, we are mad. It will be worse than anything we could experience. If you're a visitor with the, here with us this morning, I am genuinely glad that you're here. You may be thinking, look, this is all thoroughly unattractive. Seems medieval, vindictive, off-putting. A God who is wrathful, angry, judges people. Or you may be a follower of Jesus, and for you this kind of doesn't sit right either. We do get wrong-footed by passages like this, don't we? Is this what God is really like? Is this the God that we want our friends and family to come to know? But there's another vital truth we need to see about God's judgment here in these words. God's wrath will be terrible to, exper to experience, it will also be just, totally, completely fair and right and good. The problem is, when we come to a passage like this, you and I think of anger by relating it to the anger that we've experienced in this life. And it's often pretty ugly and unattractive, isn't it? So someone lashed out at, in anger at work this week, perhaps because things were not done as they would like them to be done. And you know very well that anger is a product of their pride and their self-importance. It's ugly. Or maybe you get angry at home and you fly off the handle in a moment of impatience and unkindness. The anger is unattractive. It's a wrong thing, a damaging thing. But there is such a thing as right anger, isn't there? A parent who feels no anger when their child is mercilessly bullied, we'd say there's something wrong there. A spouse who feels no anger when marital unfaithfulness is uncovered, we'd say there's something wrong there. Anger can be a good thing. And when it comes to thinking about God's wrath, we need to remember there is a categorical difference between our anger and his anger. Our anger produced by greed, pride, self-importance. His anger, well, throughout the Bible, it is always and only provoked by wickedness. It's been said that it is, it is his right and settled hostility to all that is evil. It's what God's wrath is. Now let's rewind and see this for ourselves in this chapter. Chapter 15, verse 5, if you would. After this I looked, and in heaven the temple, that is the tabernacle of the testimony, was opened. Out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues. They were dressed in clean shining linen and wore golden sashes round their chest. The temple is described as the tabernacle of the testimony. I think that's a reference to the stone tablets of the covenant which were put inside the tabernacle. God's covenant word with his people. 
And in Leviticus 26, God had promised a sevenfold punishment on those who disobeyed his covenant. So here is the covenant God carrying out his covenant curse. It's not a spur of the moment thing, a flying off the handle thing. It is quite in line with who God is and what he is like. Who will carry it out for him? Verse 6, seven angels dressed in clean, shining linen. Now, this word for linen is only used here in the book of Revelation. It's used elsewhere in the Bible of clothing for priests, as if the angels of wrath have a sacred and pure duty to fulfill. Their mission of bringing God's wrath is pure and good. You might remember pictures like this one from the Crimea in 2014. Uh, Men like this became known as little green men. They used the same guns as the Russian army. They drove in lorries with Russian number plates. They spoke Russian. But according to Vladimir Putin, they were locally organized self-defense groups. And unsurprisingly, in the West, the charge was made that they were just doing Putin's dirty work for him, doing what Russia was too ashamed to do openly, Do you see how different it is in Revelation 15? There's no shame, no embarrassment as God exercises his wrath. The angels in priestly clothing, their mission one of purity. And there's no doubt about who commissioned them. Did you see the golden sash around their chest? The golden sash is worn by Jesus in chapter 1. As if to say that their mission, these angels of wrath, is bang in line with his mission in chapter 1. Their purposes in line with his purposes. Their hearts beating in line with that of the Lord Jesus. And they don't take the bowls of wrath for themselves. They're given them by the four living creatures. You might remember in chapter 4, they were the ones closest to God's throne. Smoke or cloud in the Old Testament, it speaks of God's awesome and glorious presence It once stopped Moses from entering the tabernacle, Exodus 40. It now stops anyone from entering the temple. We're being reminded that God is glorious, awesome, dangerous for sinful people. And it is this awesome God who personally commissions these agents of wrath. Chapter 16, verse 1. I don't think there's anyone in the temple at this stage except God, so I think it's his voice. Go pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. God's wrath will be just. It can be easy, I think, as we chat with friends and neighbors, to be somewhat embarrassed about God's wrath and to try and get him off the hook for it. The thing is, to borrow a phrase from one writer, God doesn't want to be let off the hook for it. As people experience God's wrath, they will be experiencing his just and good punishment. Actually, when you stop and think about it, love is not the enemy of wrath. Because God is good and loving, that doesn't mean he should love all things. It doesn't mean he should love child abuse, or theft, or greed, or gossip, or selfishness, or envy. No, precisely because he's a good and loving God, those things provoke his wrath, his anger, his right and settled hostility to all that is evil. And on the day when that wrath comes, you and I will see that it is totally just. So that our praise of God will echo the angels' praise of him in verse 5. Just glance down at what they say. You are just in these judgments, you who are and who were the Holy One, because you have so judged. For they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets. You've given them blood to drink as they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. I'm sure you're like me and that you find it hard if you're a Christian person to think of God judging your non-Christian but treasured family and friends. And maybe as you read this, you bristle and think, is it fair? Is it too extreme? 
But one day we will see things clearly. As we see the Lord God clearly in his awesome majesty, as we see sin clearly in all of its grim rebellion, as we ourselves are transformed to be like the Lord Jesus in character, I take it we will say, true and just are your judgments. I couldn't see it fully then, or I struggled to see it then, but I see it now. True and just are your judgments. Notice that here at last, the persecution of God of God's people, our brothers and sisters, has been addressed. Comforting as we read news from Sri Lanka or the Sudan or Nigeria, true and just are your judgments, will be the cry. God's wrath will be just as people face his wrath. There will be no cry in hell of that's not fair. There will also be no repentance, if I've understood this passage correctly. Did you see that, verse 9? Um, they, they were seared by the intense heat and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify him. Or verse 11, and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they refused to repent of what they'd done. Or verse 21, just at the end, and they cursed God on account of the plague of hail. So as people find themselves experiencing God's wrath, it's not the case that they humbly admit wrongdoing. That wasn't the case in Egypt, was it, with Pharaoh? And it's not the case here. The passage portrays an ongoing defiance, a a, a fist raised against God still, cursing him. God's wrath will be just. I think the justness of God's wrath probably cuts different ways for different people in the room here today. It may be that you've been on the receiving end of injustice or that you've been moved deeply by the injustices faced by our brothers and sisters around the world. One day, true justice will be done. That is a comfort. But it might be that you're just struggling with that justness of God, that justness, the justice of God's wrath. I think we can take comfort in the words of the angel. You are just in these judgments. And the response of the altar, however an altar responds, true and just are your judgments. It will be terrible to experience God's wrath, and it will be totally just. You don't need to fear that God's character is somehow besmirched by these judgments. Where does that leave us? Well, let's focus on one final verse. There's one more truth about God's wrath, but we're really going to focus on the application for us. God's wrath will come suddenly, and in the same verse, verse 15, keep faithful to Jesus. Do you see that verse 15 is actually an interruption? At verse 14, the anti-God forces have been gathering for battle. Verse 14 would have flowed very well into verse 16. Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. That is a place name which has been um, much popularized in films and so on. But really to the Hebrew mind, it just spells big battle. When you hear Som or Pearl Harbor or Hiroshima, you think big battle. So too for Armageddon, the Megiddo Plain. Many big battles fought there. And here a big battle is being foretold as the anti-God forces gather against him. And in the middle of this description, Jesus himself interrupts. Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. Here we are as the anti-God forces seem to be on the march, as countless people are duped into following them and uniting against the Lord God in rejecting him. And Jesus interrupts, Behold, I come like a thief. You'll recognize the language from the Gospels, I'm sure. I come suddenly. I come unannounced. 
I come unexpected. And so blessed is he who stays awake, who is ready, who in revelation language keeps his clothes with him. Do you see really that this passage is much simpler than it might first have appeared? Remember that yellow warning sign? Lots of questions, lots of details we're not given. Stay away from the pylon. Here this portrait of God's judgment. Lots of questions we may have, lots of details we're not given. Be ready. I'm coming like a thief. We're in Revelation, so the clothing, no surprise, is symbolic. You might remember the Laodiceans in chapter 3 who were counseled to buy from Jesus white clothes to wear to cover their shameful nakedness. Or think of people before the throne in chapter 7 wearing white robes washed in the blood of the Lamb. Here is a call to remain faithful to the Lord Jesus, to keep trusting in him for salvation, to depend on him and his death for us. And doesn't the portrait of God's wrath here Show us how thankful we can be for Jesus' death. Everything these plagues symbolize, every inch of pain and agony you can imagine, for God's people that has all been faced by the Lord Jesus for us, uh, experienced on our behalf so that we might not need to experience it. This clothing that Jesus offers, this gift of his righteousness, being clothed in his righteousness so that we're safe. Well, it's more precious than anything, isn't it? More precious than a stab vest to a policeman. More precious than one of those all-in-one suits we're seeing on the news for those who work in Ebola-affected areas. Nothing so precious as the clothing Jesus gives. So stay awake. The outpouring of God's wrath to you as you enjoy a lunch break in Bournemouth Gardens, perhaps, it might feel dim and distant, but one day, verse 17, the announcement will come, it is done. Judgment will arrive. This world will not roll on forever. How useful this passage is in reminding us of that. If you know you're not ready, what could be more urgent? Come to Jesus today trusting in him, asking him to make you ready, to forgive you so that you can be clothed and safe for that day. And for those of us who have come to him, do you think verse 15 helps us when we're tempted to be ashamed of him? When we're tempted by the world that opposes and ignores Jesus, when we think life would be so much easier if I could blend in, if I didn't feel so exposed the whole time as a follower of Jesus, if I didn't feel so naked and on my own, behold, I come like a thief. To be shamefully exposed on that day, to be caught naked on that day, that will be unbearable. So whatever you do, stay awake. Keep your clothes with you. The precious robe of his righteousness Keep trusting in him, depending on him, being faithful to him. Nothing more important we could do this week. Let's pray. Psalm 32 says this, Therefore let everyone who is godly <clears throat> pray to you while you may be found. Surely when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Heavenly Father, we praise you that there has been time for us to pray to you while you may be found, to be clothed in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus. And may every memory of this passage this week only drive us to keep trusting in him, rejoicing in him, depending on him, and living faithfully for him. Amen.